there's three reasons why you suffer, and one is, well, look at you and the way you're built, it's inevitable. There's not very much of you and there's a lot of everything else. And so, you just don't last that long and you're fragile across multiple domains and then you're harshly treated by society and there's no doubt about that and then there's responsibility that can be laid at your own feet well the existential take on that and the thing that all these diverse people that we've been talking about including Viktor Frankl and including Alexander Solzhenitsyn as well as um, uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and the people that I've already talked to you about is that the proper pathway through that is to adopt the mode of authentic being and that is something like refusing to participate in the lie in deception and the lie to orient your speech as much as you can towards the truth and to take responsibility for your own life and perhaps also for the lives of other people and there's something about that that's meaningful and responsible and noble but also serves to mitigate the very suffering that produces, say, the nihilism, or the flee into the arms of, flee, or, or, the, or the escape into the arms of totalitarians to begin with. You need something to shelter you against your own vulnerability. And you can adopt a comprehensive description of reality that's formulated for you by someone else that neatly divides the world into those who are innocent and perhaps innocent victims, and those who are guilty and perhaps the perpetrators of the suffering. But none of that has anything to do with you, and in addition, it's simply not, it's not a reasonable way of assessing the world. The, the suffering is built in. So that's why the, there's an existentialist insistence upon that. So that for the Freudians, the psychoanalysts, and even for people like Carl Rogers to some degree, if you're in a situation that's characterized by psychopathology, if there's something wrong with you mentally, that's a consequence of something gone wrong. But that's not the existentialist take. The existentialist take is, no, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine. But it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward. There's a pathway forward. And the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility. So that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering and that the pathway forward as far as the existentialists are concerned is by, well certainly by the avoidance of deceit particularly in language but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them and the thing that's so interesting about that is well two as far as I'm concerned and some of this is from clinical experience, you know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet. Because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider. But there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world, and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well... Imagine that many people did that, because we've done a lot as human beings, we've done a lot of remarkable things, and I've told you already, I think before, that today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty, and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin, and that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. 
The UN had pl planned to have poverty between 2000 and 2015, and it was accomplished by 2013. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. And we have no idea how fast we could multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done. That's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's... 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient. 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting too, is that and like one of the another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is, you know, there's this idea that, that people have that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is. It's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens, so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident. Because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe, and that's a very, very difficult thing to negotiate. But if you do negotiate it, well, at least you, you have something, you have somewhere solid to stand, and you have somewhere to live, you have a real life. And it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world, for example, because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death, which is what happens in a, tremendous, a tremendously large minority of cases. Well, it's more than that, too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see. Because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way. 
and then it'll decline rapidly. But seven billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that seven billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people, at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each, and that puts you one person away from a million, and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected, and the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really ask yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff, and I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr, so that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. Especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really. Really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends. Because that's what happened in the 20th century.